Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 403, 503, Digital Rhetoric, Discourse, and Culture with yours truly, Dr. Matt Barton. And today we'll be looking at this, uh, well, you watched a video by Lawrence Lessig. Uh, let's see if I have it here. Yeah, from the Google Author Series. Uh, but you might, after this, want to uh, read his books, Lessig's books. He's got some really good, popular books of just about everybody in the field of digital rhetoric or internet studies or digital media, social, whatever you want to call this thing we're doing. Uh, people read this book, Free Culture. Uh, not just this one. He's got several other ones. He's got one called Code. I think he's got a getting kind of more political uh, in these, uh, in his later books, you know, the few code version 2.0. Uh, so most people will, again, if you go to a computers and composition conference, people will know who you're talking about. Uh, if you bring up uh, Lawrence Lessig, uh, matter of fact, the first time I heard him was at the conference on uh, college composition and communication, the four C's. Uh, the big composition and rhetoric conference. You know, they brought him in there uh, because at, uh, at that time, and to some extent still, I would say, uh, there was a lot of attention. People were really kind of interested in his thoughts on copyright law, intellectual property, uh, in the context of the this new uh, thing we had called the Internet <laughs> and blogging and wikis. You know, there's just a lot of stuff going on that people hadn't uh, really had a lot of time to think about from a legal perspective perspective you know how do we uh, handle all something like wikipedia who who owns that <laughs> you know somebody wants to sue you for something on a wikipedia page who's responsible who can we sue where's you know, you're trying to follow the money like where's the money uh, plus people were really up in arms about the uh, sort of uh, big corporations that run the the media i think there was some, what was that figure that got tossed around a lot like Something like maybe six giant mega corporations controlled like 90% of all the media, you know, something like that. Uh, they were really, you, you know, uh, the people that Lessig was kind of targeting, the big recording industry, recording industry, Association of America, something like that. And uh, there's similar ones for motion pictures. Uh, those uh, corporations haven't done themselves a lot of favors. You know, they kind of got this bad reputation for being... Uh, really unfair and taking advantage, basically exploiting the, the heck out of uh, uh, the talent and the writers and all this, you know, the people involved in making the stuff. <laughs> you know, there, it's easy to find just about any, uh, uh, you know, any hit maker. Who's the guy from uh, Smashing Pumpkins? You know, I just heard uh, heard him talking about this. Now he how he got these uh, really bad end of a, was it Billy Corgan, something like that? Uh, anyway, the, the Smashing Pumpkins guy, uh, he had an interview where he was talking about basically how he got exploited by the recording industry. Uh, so he, Lessig was kind of going against those uh, those folks. So it, got, it was pretty well received. Uh, frankly, a lot of people almost got uh, evangelical, <laughs> uh, if you will, about free culture. It's almost kind of like a neo-marxist kind of a thing right you, you read free culture and you want to go <laughs> go buy a a beret you know and uh, you go marching up and down uh, uh, <laughs> in front of a recording studio <laughs> yeah i mean you know kind of have a little fun with this but that, that's the sort of climate uh where this book landed and so lessig did this thing called creative commons that we talked about uh, so we've got a lot of stuff to cover here um, but i thought i would just kind of start here by talking about some of the people that kind of came before Lessig and what, what's the deal? Where is this coming from? What does this have to do with digital media? You know, copyright law. Uh, you might not have thought a lot about that and, and how it's affected by uh, the web and blogging and so on and so forth. Uh, well, one of the uh, one of the progenitors, I guess, of this these sorts of movements like Creative Commons and... Uh, uh, free software, Linux, if you're familiar with that. Uh, there's an operating system. You might not even know about this, but you know how you have Microsoft Windows and you, Apple, whatever they call that these days, <laughs> Macintosh OS. <laughs> uh, there's a version, there's one of those called Linux, and it's just totally free. You know, they, 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 you can look at the code for it. You can add to the code if you're a programmer, uh, but you don't have to pay anybody to use that. You don't have to get anybody's permission you want to modify that uh, so that's 
uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in the digital you know, sort of computer side of things uh, that pertains to this topic. So that's one way it comes in. But, you know, this guy here, you know, he's a... <laughs> You know, what to make of him, uh, Richard Stallman. You know, I think it's kind of unfair to him in a way because he, he, you know, he did originate so much of this stuff, but he's kind of a wacky, kind of eccentric. I think that's probably putting it very mildly. <laughs> I don't know what he's into these days. <laughs> uh, you can probably tell just from looking at this photo. Uh, you know, he likes to have a little fun and, you know, he's got the long hair and everything, uh, the big beard. Uh, but he's important because he started basically started this free software movement. He was doing Linux before before uh, Linus Torvalds and, and the Linux uh, uh, operating system even was a thing. He was doing this thing called GNU, uh, G-N-U. And the story with him, he was working in, at MIT, I believe, an artificial intelligence lab. And he was uh, trying to get a printer <laughs> to work. <laughs> You know, who hasn't been there, right? So he's like, oh, my God, I can't print this thing. What the heck? Uh, here I am, a you know, super advanced, super genius computer programmer. Even even I can't get this stupid printer to print. Uh, and the reason, so he was like, you know, this is just so frustrating. I'm just going to program a new printer driver. You know, he's on that, that level. Uh, but when he tried to uh, do that, he found that he could not get to the code. So the script, you know, that you know that tells the computer what to do, that was kind of locked up. It was closed behind. Uh, it's actually been. Uh, <laughs> it's the way programming uh, programs get compressed and, and compiled and so on. But uh, but anyway, that was uh, weird for him because he was used to this world, especially on these big mainframe computers, where you know anybody could just go in and look at the code and. You know, you just, if, you, if it wasn't working, you just changed it yourself. You know, kind of like uh, the old-fashioned Volkswagen cars, right? The people's car. Uh, they called these the Volkswagens that because the idea was, you, you know, anybody could, could fix these cars. They were very simply made. Uh, a lot of people still, I got friends that still love, you know, tinkering around with their old Beetles and the vans and everything. Uh, you don't need to be a mechanic, a professional, or a know any have advanced equipment you know to work on these these cars and it was the same sort of thing uh back in this time uh for stallman that's what he was used to doing right uh, but anyway this printer was locked he couldn't get to the, the source code so he got really upset about that and so he started this free software movement and the free there doesn't mean necessarily that it's free for you to, to buy it it's it's free as in you're free to look at the code you're free to uh, modify the code. If you want to use that code for something else, you know, it's, it's totally okay to do that. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like public domain. So instead of seeing a program only through the application, the interface, uh, if it's a free software, you know, if it's, if it's free software, then you could say, look, I want to look at the source code and make a little change to the way this software works. Uh, so that's what kind of got him started and that led to the... Uh, all these uh, GNU applications and eventually Linux, uh, that operating system I was telling you about. Uh, but anyway, as I said, he's a little bit eccentric. Uh, so Lessig, uh, one of his, uh, what made him so appealing, you know, he's, uh, I think he's a you know, law professor, activist. He's very, very articulate. He's very, uh, compared to somebody like Stallman, uh, you know, you can sit down and read Lessig's books and you're like, this you know, this is reasonable. I, I see where he's coming from. He, he writes well. It's clear. Uh, very engaging. You know, like I say, you read these books. It's got lots of examples in here. Uh, they really get you motivated to go out and do something. So let's, he's got a couple different things. I made some notes here about some points I wanted to hit on here. Uh, so first of all, the long tail. Let's see if I can get a picture of that to help you out. Yeah, there we go. The long tail model. Uh, so this is a pretty cool thing. I think it was Chris Anderson, maybe of Wired, came up with this concept. Uh, but I think I can break this down fairly quickly because I don't think Lessig really... Uh, I think he kind of expects you to already know about what he's talking about with this concept. Uh, but if you think about when I grew up, or if you're as old as I am, you might remember this. There would be a hit song on the radio. <laughs> you know, everybody was talking about it. 
your buddy go out and buy the uh, the record or the tape, uh, you know, whatever the media was, the CD. Uh, and then, you know, maybe a week or two later, nobody would even know who you're talking about. <laughs> and you sort of have these little narrow windows, something would be popular, it'd be on the radio, uh, and then quickly it just kind of disappeared. You know, you know, same thing with movies. You'd go to the movie, uh, you'd watch it, and that's it. You know, there was no, you might rent a tape <laughs> uh, from Blockbuster a lot later, but... Uh, you know, pretty much everything would be like in that first couple weeks, maybe first month or so after it came out. Uh, you'd have just a very, very few sort of big hit makers. You know, same thing in books, right? You, you go to the bookstore, you sort of got these best-selling authors that totally dominate uh, the bookstore. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, the smaller bookstores, maybe they only have those bestsellers. You know, that's kind of up here. So the ones that are making all the money... <laughs> Uh, but, of course, you know, there's lots of other authors out there besides uh, Stephen King, Daniel, uh, Daniel, uh, her name, Steele, uh, you know, the, the authors. <laughs> uh, so a lot of these authors, maybe they don't sell very many copies. Maybe they're more niche, you know, we might call them. Uh, so they're kind of like down, you know, in here somewhere, you know, and then all the way uh, down into these micro-influencers. Uh, so what the, the the genius of this concept was this again internet was relatively new uh, so he was saying in this uh, argument that a lot of the stuff that would be it really wouldn't work in a regular bookstore you can't just have a bookstore that's just infinite infinite number of books just millions and millions of books <laughs> you know they've only got so much shelf space basically uh, so there's you know it's kind of there's not that long of a tail right you you're just looking there at books that have sold a certain number of copies. Uh, but if it's online, you know, then you don't, uh, you know, that kind of changes things, right? Because now it actually makes sense to publish a book, uh, you know, especially like a digital book on Kindle. Maybe only uh, 100 people, maybe only like 20 people will ever buy that book. Uh, but the costs are so low just to have it there on the, on the storefront, digital storefront, you know, basically costs nothing uh, to make that book available. Uh, so you could make a, you know, a little bit of money here. Maybe there's, a, let's say you got a hundred books that only sell sell maybe a few dozen copies. Uh, still, when you add it all up in this, with that model, you can actually make some money, and it starts to make uh, economic sense. I'll give you another example. Uh, Steam games. Uh, so uh, the same thing with like with the books and the music uh, with the game. You know, the game comes out. Oh, there's a new Call of Duty coming out. There's a new uh, Final Fantasy, you know, whatever the case may be, new Pokemon. Uh, so everybody's uh, talking about it. There's a big buzz. A lot of the websites, gaming websites, you might even hear about it on the regular news. It's a you know, big, big deal. Uh, the game comes out, sells millions and millions of copies. Everybody's uh, thrilled. Uh, you know, and again, a few weeks later, who's talking about it? They've already moved on to the uh, next big thing. Uh, and furthermore, sometimes... Uh, these games, uh, you know, a new console comes out, and now you can't even run the that game anymore, right? It doesn't work on the new console. It's it's incompat. It does, it's not compatible uh, anymore. So you have uh, an even more pronounced version of this. Uh, but again, with the Steam games, you know, they can set it up so that you can play. You know, again, cost them basically nothing to have this game available. So even if the game is 10, 11 years old, a lot of times you could still buy it on Steam. Uh, it, they can uh, make it work on your modern computer, uh, and it's great. You know, so even though maybe it only sells a few copies here and there, it's worth it for them to keep that on. Uh, so anyway, back to the main point here is that we're kind of moving from this idea of just those big hits making all the difference, and, and more towards this model where every you know even like small time indie indie game developer or a you know, small-time author can publish something on a Kindle, you know, maybe be able to make enough money to get by on. <laughs> you may, may not be talking about the millions of dollars of a Stephen King, uh, but, you know, if you can make, you know, 50, 60,000 a year doing these books and pumping them out on a Kindle, you know, hey. Okay, so that's this long tail idea. And with that, uh, what Lessig uh, talks about is how one of the things that's kind of uh, opposing this model of the 
you might call it like the regular citizen producing things or <laughs> being becoming a prosumer instead of a con- uh, consumer, just kind of passive, passively taking on, absorbing media, uh, being able to turn that around and, and producing stuff uh, like fan fiction or you know the spoof videos that we've talked about, uh, remixes of songs, uh, even to some extent quoting sources and things in an academic context even even things like that kind of runs into this uh copyright law and um coming back to the games uh, for example which i actually think this example works pretty well here Uh, so the the people that publish these games don't want you to be able just to copy that game and give it to your friends Uh, they used to have a a little video called don't copy that floppy (laughs) Or, you know, all this, you know, same thing with the CDs. You know, these CD burners come out. They're like, oh, my God, what? what? Napster, are you kidding me? Uh, they're stealing uh, all this content. Uh, so at Lessig's point is, we sort of had this copyright system that had been around for, you know, hundreds of years, basically. Uh, and it worked pretty well for that pre-digital era, you know, when things were still, uh, you know, when it was a CD before it was digitized. When you had to go buy a book, <laughs> it was kind of expensive to publish a book. Uh, but the the internet was kind of a game changer because now you just make a PDF, you can send it around. It, you know, it's basically it's really competition uh, for these uh, book publishers. It's kind of hard to make a living when people can get the same thing easily uh, for free. Uh, so the copyright law uh, didn't seem to be working too well in those new contexts because it was those laws were made before. Uh, the internet basically Uh, so that was one problem the other problem was that the publishers were able to use software itself to restrict your ability to uh, do things with those products uh, be it a book or a song or film whatever Uh, they could use what they call DRM digital rights management which is basically software that's sort of built in to the product Uh, so for example if you get on uh, Kindle, uh, Amazon, Kindle, I, you know, I love it and all, but there's certain things you can't do, right? You might think, well, what if I want to send this to a friend? Or just, what if I just want to print this out? Or what if I want to copy a big chunk of text and, you know, paste it into uh, this Word document I'm working on? Well, the DRM kicks in, you know, basically just won't let you do that. Uh, you might have been looking at ebooks or websites, and you're like, why can't I copy this part? Or, you know, why can't I do this or that? Or... Why can't I play this game without having to log into the internet? And, you know, uh, <laughs> why do I have to create an account on this, you know, stupid website just to be able to uh, look at this document or play this game? You know, that, that's all the kind of stuff that uh, Lessig is talking about here. It's stuff that's not necessarily part of the legal system. It's just the technology uh, that these uh, publishers have created over the years to try to manage, you know, how to keep people from being what they call a pirate. Right, just somebody who, uh, instead of buying a book, buying a game, uh, they get it uh, illegally somehow, uh, BitTorrent, you know, whatever the <laughs> whatever the case may be. Uh, so Lessig's point uh, in this book was that kind of uh, they've kind of gone too far with this. It's, they they kind of gotten too powerful. Uh, they're able to restrict things uh, too tightly uh, with the technology, and that is actually impeding. Uh, what he basically says is sort of the next generation of content creators, the next generation of artists, uh, need to be able to freely sample uh, works. Uh, They need to be able to build on uh, the stuff that they've grown up reading and enjoying. Uh, It's just kind of the way culture works, basically, Uh, according to Lessig. We we build on what's come before. And it was hard enough to do before when we just had the printed books and the copyright law. But now that there's all this digital rights management, uh, his view was it's just gone too uh, too far in the, in the control zone. Uh, so to that end, he created this Creative Commons system. We can bring that back up so you can see this again. <laughs> when we share, everyone wins. There is kind of an optimistic uh, vibe uh, to this sort of thing, but... You know, again, to come back to game development, um, it's relatively easy for somebody to learn how to make a simple game. 
Uh, and you might want to have, you probably want to have some music in the game. Uh, you probably want some graphics and so on and so forth. Uh, so with the Creative Commons, you could be an artist and you might uh, not care about money. You know, maybe you just do things for fun. Uh, you don't want to be uh, maybe making uh, 3D models, for example. Maybe that's not your career. <laughs> maybe you have a day job, but you just really like making uh, models. You like animating things or you like making music. You know, I was thinking, uh, you know, God knows how many people have a guitar uh, they just like to play. <laughs> you know, they, they don't buy it with the expectation of making that their career. Uh, it's just something they enjoy doing. And they, you know, they might write a song and say, you know, uh, I'm not doing anything with it. <laughs> you know, here's a song I wrote. Uh, you could put it online, uh, put a Creative Commons license on it. And you could say, look, if you want to use this song in a video that you're doing, or you want to use my song in a game, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to pay me. I'm just giving this away. The only thing I want is for you to mention my name somewhere. So don't just say this is your song. Uh, you know, you have to put somewhere on there, song by Matt Martin. <laughs> and maybe uh, you could even say, I want a link to my website on there. You know, whatever the case may be. And so what it does is instead of making, if you want to use my song, you don't have to find me and contact me and ask my permission, as you would with the traditional uh, copyright setup, and sometimes you don't even know who owns the copyright. You know, maybe this is an old song that you just found somewhere, and maybe the original musician is long gone, and you could just never be able to find like who actually owns the rights to that song. Uh, it wouldn't be a problem if they had used Creative Commons, because then they could just say, it's free to share, here's the license, use it in the game, just uh, <laughs> you know, make sure you cite me in there. Uh, and there's other versions of this. You can say, uh, yeah, you could say you can use it. You can remix it. So if I make a song, you want to speed it up. You want to take get some pieces of it and use it in another song. Uh, you could say that's okay, or you could say no, don't do that. I don't want you to do that. <laughs> you can only use it, you know, complete. Uh, you can make those sorts of uh, decisions when you make a license things this way. Uh, so that kind of in a nutshell is some of the issues that he gets up to. And you probably picked up on some of that uh, from his uh, lecture for Google. But, you know, I think he talked in there about how Google itself would not work <laughs> uh, under the sort of restrictive regime of digital rights management. You know, they have the Google Books where they went in and scanned all of these books and they made it available to search. Uh, so I could search through all these books. Now, Google did not pay all those book publishers for the rights to use all those books. Uh, so, you know, they claimed uh, that they should be able to do that anyway, or they shouldn't have to get permission because they have this fair use. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that, uh, but it's just a way to uh, say, yes, uh, I understand this is copyrighted, but it's fair for me to use it in this way because I'm, for example, uh, not competing with the book publishers. I'm not making the book available. I'm just uh, letting people search through it for a certain key phrase or keyword. And that's not going to in any way uh, prevent somebody from wanting to buy uh, a copy of that book is basically one of the arguments. Other arguments are, you know, I'm just using it for classroom purposes. Uh, there's some workarounds, legal uh, loopholes basically for that. And of course, if you want to review it, criticize it, make a parody of it. You know, there's all sorts of uh, loopholes around that. But, uh, you know, as Lessig points out, Google was making a lot of money, you know, with this uh, particular loophole. So a lot of people weren't too happy with that. And, of course, on YouTube, a lot of people like to put songs in their YouTube videos. Uh, Lessig talks about some of those. Uh, but ha fortunately, I guess in that case, they a lot of these recording uh, companies made it so that if you, uh, for example, put a bit of a Prince song, <laughs> maybe you want to play a little bit of a little red Corvette in your video, uh, instead of just YouTube coming along and taking your video down or banning you or something like that or <laughs> and trying to arrest you or sue you, uh, instead of that, uh, they just have this deal with the publisher so that um, you know they'll, they'll let you uh, have your video with the music, but they'll have a thing on it that says this song is... You know, Prince's little red Corvette, click here. Uh, 
you know, to buy the CD or to, or to buy it for iTunes or whatever. Uh, plus, um, I'm pretty sure that YouTube has to pay a little bit of money maybe every time somebody listens to that music. So it's kind of like a this kind of win-win. Uh, the only person who doesn't win is you. <laughs> and because if you have uh, that happen, and it's happened to me, uh, if you have a little bit of a song, maybe just a little tiny little sliver of a song, uh, just even as a joke, uh, they'll come along and say, then, you know, this, this song has a, or this video has a song in it by so-and-so, and they won't let me put any advertisements. So, if you know about YouTube, you know the creators typically make money by letting people, uh, letting YouTube run ads on the video in various ways. Uh, so, if, you, if you're caught, though, with a copyrighted song, uh, they take that away from you. So, instead of you making the money, uh, now it's going to be, you know, that advertising money is going to go to the... Uh, studio or the company that owns the copyrights to, <laughs> to that song okay whew. anyway obviously we could go on about this for quite a bit but i do encourage you uh, you know especially if you like uh, intellectual property uh, which by the way don't use that word around richard stallman because he does not like <laughs> he says well the whole problem is you're thinking about ideas as property i'll let you read about that if you want uh, but i would recommend reading free culture if you're interested in these issues and his other book uh, code's pretty good uh, and he mentions a couple other books in here too that you should you should check out but anyway about a half an hour so i think i'll stop it here love to know what you think about all this and i'll catch you next time